Hi, I'm Art Bergeron and welcome to the 12th and last episode of a series that I started uh, in January, it's now December, uh, on, El which I, in, on Elder Law 101. I tried very hard through this series and I think, I'm, interesting, I've gotten comments from folks who said that they've actually been following it all the way through, that the point of this series was to really um, help you as a senior or as the relative of a senior understand all of the issues that a senior might confront really during their whole lifetime. So I started off by taking my friends Frank and Mary uh, and their kids Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And I always tell people, you know, if you're old enough to get the joke, you're old enough to be my client. I took them kind of through their lives from the first presentation when they were under 60 and they had problems that were very different from, from when they get older through issues in their 60s as they were heading toward retirement and then into their 70s when they were starting to you know, think about maybe moving from their home or slowing down. Um, we talked a lot, we talked in, back in April about income taxes, because it was tax season. Uh, then we talked about life uh, for Frank and Mary in their 80s, uh, how, those issues, how they dealt with those issues. I talked about how you can always qualify for mass health, which is the, one of the first questions that people talk to me about when they walk in the door. Any client of mine, my median client age is 74, any client of mine who was talking to me wants to know about those issues. I talked a lot about, um, in one seminar, about the last year of your life, which you might be living right now, and it could be that, that, it, uh, that death comes upon you suddenly or gradually, but the point is there are a set of issues when you're in during that time, especially if you kind of know ahead, ahead of time that things are coming because you're getting frailty, there are a set of things that you really need think, to think of doing, to do. Uh, I talked specifically about post-mortem, what happens after you're dead, what are all the things that your children or your spouse or whoever need to do to deal with issues that you might have left behind and how can you plan better so as to um, reduce the stress and the time involved in all of that. I talked specifically about trusts, the three basic kinds which people are always, I'm always talking to folks about, the revocable trust, the irrevocable trust, and the so-called testamentary trust that's part of your will. I had a specific presentation about what to do about in your estate planning um, regarding the kids and the grandkids. Um, I talked about Medicare, which is an essential part of life as a senior, is constantly re-examining your Medicare package. Uh, and then finally today, tis the season, so we're talking about uh, issues that you would be facing typically at the end of the year. Um, and, and a lot of times this is just about giving, but I, I want to be talking specifically about some um, uh, income tax and related estate tax planning as it relates to giving. So once again, I always talk about my friends Peter, or, uh, Frank and Mary and the kids Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. Their, their goals are very simple. They want to stay in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. They want to leave everything to the kids. But there are a couple of other things that they want. They want to not pay taxes or pay as little as possible and they don't want to get clobbered by nursing home care, which for seniors ha becomes the biggest issue uh, and really comes to outweigh tax considerations, avoiding probate, the big potential catastrophe that can happen to a senior um, is, is what happens if you need nursing home care. So I'm gonna talk about, uh, about things in relation to that especially. So uh, in my, um, my case for today, we're talking about Frank and Mary who own their house. It's currently worth about $400,000. Now, once again, I do a lot of work on the islands where this number is somewhere between a million and $2 million, but all of the concepts are the same. Say the house is worth $400,000. Say they've got joint savings of $300,000. For today's purposes, I'm assuming that Mary is the one with the big R IRA. Uh, typically for my clients, it's Frank but it just makes it easier for me to explain today. To assume that Mary has a very large IRA, the total assets a million three, uh, Frank's, their income, not counting their required minimum distribution, um, uh, is about $40,000 a year. Uh, so you should know that on that $40,000 a year, the top marginal tax rate for their money is 12%. Uh, and the tax is about 2%, or excuse me, the tax is about $2,000 a year if that's Frank and Mary's situation. So um, first question, before you can understand uh, how Ma Frank and Mary may want to think about their assets in relation to nursing home issues, 
You need to understand what would happen if today Mary just fell down the stairs or, or, and, or was now in ha or had a stroke and was now in a nursing home and was going to need to stay there for the rest of her life. What would happen in that case to a person with these kinds of assets? Um, well, amazingly enough, because Frank is alive in that situation, Mary could actually qualify for MassHealth, which is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. Um, that it would be really important to Mary since um, once she'd been in that nursing home um, for more than 100 days, uh, her Medicare would no longer pay for the nursing home care. So if she had that stroke, uh, and it sounded like she was just going to be there for, for a long, long time, um, she'd be very concerned that, that after that 100 days, she'd be paying privately at a rate which is around $16,000 a month now on the private pay side. Obviously, this varies by nursing home. But the point is that, as, as I've talked about before, in that situation, Mary could actually qualify for MassHealth almost immediately. How could she do that? Um, well, first she could do it by transferring all of her assets to, to Frank. But wait, you say, isn't there a look back period? No, as I've so often repeated, there is no look back period regarding transfers between spouses. I'm always talking to clients uh, who are couples who are telling me that they're sure that the only way they can protect their assets if one of them needs a nursing home is to give them away and wait five years. Um, with a very few exceptions, that is not the case. That is not the case because at the last minute, in, as in this situation, if Mary needs nursing home care, Mary could transfer her interest in her home, she could transfer everything else to Frank, and the day after she did that, thereby reducing her assets below uh, $2,000, um, in certain situations she could qualify for mass health. The only caveat on that is that in order for her to qualify for mass health, she needs to show that she has less than $2,000 and Frank needs to show that he has less than a particular amount of assets, not counting the house. Frank can have the house no matter what the value. And once again, I emphasize this um, because so often that's where people's big value is, especially on the island, especially on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. So um, Frank can have the house no matter what the value. Frank can have an additional $148,600 in other cash or cash equivalent assets. So in this case, after all assets had been transferred to Frank, I would tell Frank, well, if you want Mary to qualify for Mass Health, you need to keep, say, $100,000 and use the rest of the money to buy an annuity. And as long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that was shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy at that time, uh, then the purchase of that annuity in any amount would, would convert those assets into a non-countable income stream. Frank can have unlimited income. So if by doing that he's reduced his assets below the magic number, $148,600, the next day um, Mary can qualify for Mass Health. And once she's on Mass Health, her income from pension and Social Security would go to the nursing home. She wouldn't have any other income because all of her other money, all of her other assets would have been transferred to Frank. Um, and at that point, her pension, her, her income from pension and Social Security would go to the nursing home. Um, um, all, all the rest would be paid by Mass Health. So there is this wonderful strategy for dealing with all of this stuff, right? Except in Mary's case, she's got this issue because she's got $600,000 in an IRA. And so her big question is, well, how did, you know, or, or Frank's big question, because at this point Mary's in the nursing home. Um, um, Frank's big question is, uh, wow, how do I balance the fact that I'm going to get a benefit here if Mary is, is on Mass Health because our nursing home cost is going to go way down, but this is going to be a big tax hit. Specifically, um, if re remember in the earlier slide we indicated Frank and Mary's income is $40,000. If all of a sudden her, her $600,000 has to go to him, their income for that year jumps to $640,000. The, the, at the top marginal um, federal income tax rate, which is which uh, on that money, the, t the top rate would be 35% uh, on that piece of the money, their total tax would be about $161,000. So she'd really be, so Frank would really be needing to weigh what is my benefit of qualifying Mary versus the fact that I'm taking this huge tax hit. 
So it may end up being that Frank ends up deciding at that point that it's actually worth, if, if he doesn't think Mary's going to be living very long, that it's worth paying her care privately just in order to avoid this big tax hit. An alternative strategy though, this gets, and this gets down to what the, 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 the gifting strategy we want to talk about, would be for, Frank, for Mary to, to cash in um, those tax deferred funds over a period of time, thereby reducing the tax rate. If, for example, in 2023, when the top tax rate on income of, of $89,450 is only 12%, right? If Mary could say, take the income that she's going to be getting for 2023, $40,000, and instead of taking the requ her required minimum distribution regarding her um, IRA funds, which would be really minimal, she pulls out $49,450, thereby getting her total income to $89,450. Then her tax would only end up being, or the additional tax that would end up being paid on that additional $49,450 is only $6,000. Um, and, 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 and over the, the and, 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 if these, and if she took these payments, now this was assuming the tax rates stay the same, stay constant over 12 years, so this isn't exactly the right number. But if you assume that, if Mary took out her $600,000 over 12 years, the total amount of extra tax that she would be paying over that 12 years would only be $72,000. Compare that to the $161,000 that she would have to be paying if she took it out all at once. So the message for folks, for, for the, all of the Frank and Marys out there, if you're thinking about your, your, about the end of the year tax planning, you may want to talk to your, to your financial advisor or to your accountant about whether there is an amount of money that you could take out in addition to your required minimum distribution, in addition to the RMD, which wouldn't push your total income into a really high tax bracket and would, over time, get all that money out of tax deferred status. So you've paid the tax and now you can do whatever you want with it. I always talk to clients about, it, you know, when you're a senior, the goal of so much of your planning is flexibility. And the best thing you can do to give yourself that flexibility is to, is to get rid of this, this specter that if you need to take a lot of money out of tax deferred funds, you're going to end up with this really big tax hit. Now, what could Mary do with those funds? Well, she could just pull them out and, and just put them into her savings together with the other savings that Frank and Mary had. Because remember, at the last minute, if she were in the nursing home, she could always just shift those savings to Frank. And in this case, that shift is going to be tax free. She could also put the money into a Roth IRA, right? Um, shift it, or just convert the funds into a Roth IRA. From then on in, the, 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 the income on that IRA is going to be tax free. Even, when she even if she takes it out ahead of time. So she could do that, or she and Frank could decide that they want to give some of that money away to the kids or to whoever, right? And if they did that, five years in a day after they had made those gifts to the kids, to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., those gifts would be no longer countable or lienable if MassHealth later said that Mary uh, was trying to, if, or if Mary was trying to qualify for MassHealth. Now, let me give you the other example, the related example. Say Frank's dead and they haven't done any of this advanced planning. And so now Mary has all of the assets. She has 900,000, but, but say she has been pulling that money out over time. So now she has the, uh, she's, she's paid the taxes and say she now has $900,000 in savings and she has the house. It's worth a million three, right? And say, and say that Mary was trying to figure out how to qualify for mass health. Well, she'd have a real problem at that point because that $900,000 would all have to get spent down before she could qualify. At that point, the house would be safe, uh, except MassHealth would put a lien on the house. But the point is, she'd be on private pay at $16,000 a month for a long time. So tip, what is the standard asset protection strategy in that case? If I talk to Mary and she's single and Frank has already died, and now I'm typically talking to her and one of the kids and they're like, well, oh my God, what can we do to protect these assets? I, I would tell her at that point, the only way to protect the assets is to give them away and wait five years. 
give them away, that's the classic five year look back period. Typically, if there are multiple children, she'd give those assets away to one of the children as the trustee of an irrevocable trust. The trust would, be, would specify that while Mary is alive, the trustee could always make early distributions, not to Mary, but to one of the kids, so that if Mary really needed the money, um, Mary would need to trust, and this is why I would say, yeah, yeah, that's why they call them trust, you have to trust the trustee. Mary would have to trust that in that case, Peter would pull out the money, give it to himself or to one of the other kids, and they would turn around and give the money back to their mother. So you'd set up that irrevocable trust, and then Mary would gift, she wanted, if she wanted to, she could gift her $900,000 into that trust, and the money would be safe five years and a day after she had done that. But remember, in this situation, in the case I'm giving you, Frank has just died, now Mary's in to talk to me, she's probably older, and she's, say, and she, and she's saying to herself, but wait a minute, I'm older now. I may need nursing home care, wait, you know, next year, I may need it really soon. I may not have five years. And that's the point. The point is to keep Mary from ever having to be in that situation, just like keeping Frank and Mary from having been in that situation by giving things away, right? So the question then is, um, and by the way, that's consistent with what Frank and Mary's estate plan was, which is after the two of them die, they want to leave everything to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., right? So the question that they may want to ask themselves is, so why not give away some of those assets now? We either Frank and Mary together or after Frank has died, why doesn't Mary just give away some of those assets now, especially if, she's, if she has already paid the income tax on all of the income, and therefore, by giving them away, she's not gonna get penalized, right? Or maybe she wants to simply start pulling money out from her IRA every year um, in a larger amount than she otherwise would have and simply giving that money away to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., right? So why not give it away now? Um, well, tip this standard answer that everybody will tell me is, oh, well, my God, you know, because there's, a, there's some kind of a gift tax, right? I can't give away more than a particular amount, which, it, which for 2023 was $17,000 a year. For 2024, it's actually $18,000 a year. But because in, 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 uh, if I do, something bad is going to happen. Well, actually nothing bad happens. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about that. There is, there, is, there is no Massachusetts gift tax. Therefore, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later on, because this really has, affects your tax planning now that the Massachusetts estate tax has just changed. There is no Massachusetts gift tax. So um, Mary could literally give away all of her money the day before she died um, and not pay any estate tax. Uh, and the receipt of a gift is not income, right? And so you give this money to your kids, they're not gonna pay anything in tax. So the question is, but what about that $17,000, which everybody in their head says, yes, that there's this amount that I, can, that I have to, beyond which I can't give money away. That relates to the federal gift and estate tax system. As I mentioned, in Massachusetts, you can literally give away things the day before you die, thereby reduce the estate tax. At the federal level, some have thought about that and said when they were creating this, the, the estate tax, many years ago, well, we don't want that to happen. And so what they did was they created a combined federal and gift tax, federal estate and gift tax system. And the system is that if you die leaving a, a more than a given amount of money, and, and for, tw for uh, 2023 that amount was $12,920,000, right? You pay an estate tax. In the meantime, while you're alive, if you make a gift to anybody, not a gift to a, to a nonprofit organization, to a 501c3 or to a church, but a gift to anybody else, then regarding that gift, you're gonna pay a gift tax unless you qualify for one of the two exclusions, the one that everybody knows about and the one that nobody knows about. The one that everybody knows about is that there's an amount, which, uh, which used to be $10,000, but, uh, but because of the gift tax uh, bills in and, and, uh, and an inflation provision, is, was now up to 17,000 in this year, and by the way, it's gonna to go to 18,000 in 2024. If you give below a particular amount to a particular person, then, then you don't have to pay any gift tax, and everybody knows that. In addition to that, though, you have a lifetime exclusion equal to the estate tax exclusion, which is now $12,920,000.
So unless you are planning during your lifetime on giving away more than $12,920,000, effectively there is no gift tax. There is no gift tax, right? Now, by the way, you will, you will, the place that this often comes up is at the end of the year when your, ta your accountant is, is, is sending you, uh, or your tax preparer is sending you a, a thing that says, oh, give us all your information for, uh, for, the, for 2023 and include if you made any gifts, which in 2023 were more than $17,000. And, and if you tell the accountant that you did that, the accountant's gonna say, oh my, my goodness, in that case, you have to file a federal gift tax return, which is technically true. But ask the accountant in that case, well, what if I don't? What if I don't? The answer is, nothing happens if you don't. And the reason for that is because the only penalty for failure to file the gift tax return is interest on the gift tax that you otherwise would have owed. And in this case, you don't owe a gift tax, and therefore, there's no penalty. And so, there's really no especially good reason to file the gift tax return. So, let me talk about that a little bit as it relates to estate tax uh, avoidance. This is now a really big deal. Um, the Massachusetts legislature, as many of you know, recently ch changed the Massachusetts estate tax. They, they, it was changed in several ways. The one, it's kind of like I said earlier, the, the one that everybody knows about, and then there's this one that kind of no one's really paid attention to. The one that everybody knows about is that the threshold subject to taxation jumped from a million dollars to two million dollars. The other, one of the other big changes, though, is it used to be that if you were over that $1 million threshold, um, but you had made gifts during your lifetime in excess of those, the, the limits that I had just talked about, that A, you needed to file an estate tax return, and B, you were gonna owe some, end up owing some estate tax, right? That's no longer the case. So say that you're Frank and Mary and your total assets are $2,200,000. Say this is the house, $600,000, Mary's IRA, and joint savings of a million. Um, and say, um, well, if Frank dies, he can leave all the assets to Mary because there is no, um, there is no because any assets given to a surviving spouse are always subtracted from um, the estate tax. But say Mary was single and Mary gave away some of those assets, right? Mary could just literally gift her way down below $2 million, give away sufficient assets so what she had left was worth less than $2 million, and not pay any estate tax herself. Which leads me to um, the ideal uh, plan for Frank and Mary. They each have wills with so-called uh, asset protection trusts. So Frank said, Frank's will says, when I, they each say, when I die, any assets that were going to go to Mary are instead going to go in trust for my, um, for my spouse. Uh, if you structure things that way, then any assets, when the, that, when the first spouse to die, um, any assets owned by that first spouse to die are automatically protected if the surviving spouse needs to qualify for mass health. We talked about that, right? But in addition to that, if Frank owns the house at the time of his death, even though they own it jointly right now, if they, Frank owned the house at the time of his death, the tax basis of that house would jump all the way to the, the date of Frank's date of death value, right? In this case, to $600,000, even though they had paid much less for it. Think about that, though, if you're on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, where you paid a couple hundred thousand dollars for your house, and now it's worth between a million five and two million. You get the house to the, into the name of the first spouse to die before that first spouse dies, and as long as the assets are not going directly back to that spouse, but rather into a testamentary trust with a third party trustee for the benefit of that spouse, you can do that transfer the day before that spouse dies. And at the moment of that spouse's death, the tax basis jumps all the way to a million, all the way to the, to the, to the current value of the property, right? So remember, if, if, Frank and, if, one of, if, if, if either Frank or Mary needed a nursing home, um, then it, it, in the meantime, one, if one needs a nursing home, we shift everything to the other, the other spouse and the, uh, and, and the spouse uh, qualifies for mass health. Um, but then, once again, we specify in each person's will that when one spouse dies, um, the, the house, everything including the house, goes into trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse, which means the tax basis that jumped all the way to the, date, to the date of death value of the first spouse to die. 
The surviving spouse can then sell the house with that stepped up basis, pay zero in capital gains tax and give away the proceeds, or could just give away the house, right? In either case, if by doing this, the surviving spouse has reduced the surviving spouse's assets to less than $2 million, there will be no estate tax when the surviving spouse dies. So, with that in mind, uh, I hope this information was useful to you. I hope that all the information that I've given through those 12 seminars was useful to you. If there are any things that I haven't covered in those 12 seminars, please give me a call or email me. You can, just, uh, um, you can email me at, at um, abergeron at myrickoconnell.com um, and I'll try to cover that issue that we haven't covered in something called a Bergeron Brief. I've done a number of short Bergeron Briefs dealing with very specific issues. Ultimately though, um, the best thing you can do if, you're, think, if you, you're a senior and you're thinking about any estate planning issue is, watch these seminars. I've really tried through these 12 seminars to capture, all, to at least raise all of the flags that would cause you to say, I really need to talk to a lawyer about this, right? And if, and if it, that flag does go up, go talk to a lawyer because most elder law attorneys won't charge you for that advice. And the advice is, is ultimately probably the most valuable thing that you can get. So, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, happy holidays. Uh, and uh, I hope, and, I, and, and if, you, if you can, watch all these presentations. I think they'll give you a good sense of elder law. Thank you very much.